Hey, South Hills. Today we have an opportunity for you to jump into something called the 90 Day Challenge. The 90 Day Challenge is a way of giving tithing a try on a trial basis to experiment with a life-changing spiritual discipline. Maybe you're wondering, what does it look like to tithe? A tithe is simply 10% of your income or a dollar of every $10 you make. God doesn't ask us to give our first 10% back to Him because He needs our money. He wants us to trust Him with our whole heart, which is more intertwined with our money than most of us realize. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. We are so confident that you'll see God radically show up in your life over the next 90 days that we are willing to offer a refund at the end of the challenge if you disagree. There are three ways you can start this challenge today. One, you can scan the QR code on the screen right now. Two, you can go to southhills.org slash give. And three, you can just go to the connect area at one of our campuses and someone from our team will help you sign up. However you choose to step into this challenge, we are praying that you do trust God and step into one of these ways to accept the 90 day challenge and allow God to transform your heart. I'm the campus pastor here at South Hills, Santa Clarita, and it's truly an honor to have you with us today. Um, as we mentioned before, uh, all of our series, have, we get resources. We use primarily, uh, first and foremost, the Word of God uh, for our teaching series, but then we also have resources that we jump on and collect information. If that is of interest to you, if you want to dive in a little bit deeper, up on the screen are several of the resources that we use to put together this series. So we are in week three of the Economic Atheist. Again, for those who missed out on the first few weeks of this series, this term, Economic Atheist, may be foreign to you. I want to define uh, what it is. An Economic Atheist is a person who believes in God, believes in God, but declares by their lifestyle, the way they live their life, that God is not over their finances. In other words, they believe that God is real, they believe that God exists, but when it comes to their finances, they don't want God to, to touch them. They don't want guidance in there. They want to kind of have, kind of rule over their money. And so today's message is titled, How Can I Get Out of Sharing? How Can I Get Out of Sharing? Uh, before I go any longer, um, Skittles. Many of you have it on your seat. If you don't, there's somewhere around, there's a seat around there that's empty that has the Skittles. If there aren't, there's one person on the row and there aren't any Skittles, they have them all. <laughs> right? Because these are going to become hot commodities in a few if the law gets passed. They're banning Skittles in California. So right now, you, you got like sweet gold here in your hands. All right? If you, carry, if you get enough packets at the end, you just might be wealthy. You just might be wealthy. Right? But with that being said, do not, do not, this is part of my message, do not throw these away. You may be eating it during the service, right, but you, then you'll miss out what I have to share later. So just hold on to those, okay? Like I said, today is a series, is, uh, today's title is How Can I Get Out of Sharing? For those of you who have kids, right, I have four, one in particular, uh, she's not here, one of my four daughters, she's not here, but this story reminds me of her. Maybe it'll remind you of your own kids. Right? If you had kids before, have you ever bought them candy or maybe popcorn or something for your kid? Maybe at the movie theater or a ball game. 
And then you reached out, right? They're eating it. They're sitting there like, mm, enjoying it, right? And then you happen to be like reaching out to get it, and they just pull back. And they look at you like you're stupid. No, this is mine. Like, like what? Like, they, they have an issue with sharing. They have an issue with giving back to you. And it's obvious that our kids forgot a few things. It's obvious that they forgot a few things. In fact, before I jump into the nooks and crannies of today's message, I want to quickly share with you this morning four things that kids forgot or forget when it comes to sharing. Because the truth of the matter is that it's not just them, it's also us as adults. Listen to this. The first thing that our kids forget is that we provide the candy. We provide the candy, that we are the providers, that we are the source, that mom and dad are the source, and that, uh, and, and the truth is that you don't want to mess with the hand that's feeding you. That's number one. Number two is that we don't need the candy. We don't need the candy. The reality is that if we wanted to, we would buy lots of candy, lots of candy. In fact, a bathtub full of candy and make you sit there on the toilet and watch as we eat the candy. <laughs> kids, listen up. The third thing that kids forget is that we can take the candy from them. We can take the candy from them. We can simply just take the candy that we have provided that we didn't need away from the kids if we wanted to. But we can take them. And lastly, our kids forget that they need, they need to give us the candy. They need to give us the candy. Here's why. Because the quality, the quality of our relationship with our kids depends on them voluntarily giving back to us. In other words, the type of relationship that we will have with our kids depends on if our kids are going to voluntarily give back to us. You see, if my girls are cold and selfish towards me, instead of being sweet and giving, it will deeply affect our father-daughter relationship. I'm going to say that one more time because my oldest is coming. She was outside of the room. But really, it's for all of us to understand. If my girls or your kids are cold and selfish, instead of being sweet and giving, it will deeply affect our father-daughter, or your kids and yourself relationship. It puts a wedge between us. It forfeits my freedom, my liberty to bless them. It now puts the relationship on stress alert. It puts the relationship around, uh, it, it puts the relationship around division and disruption. So if our kids are not willing to share their candy with us, they're making a decision. They're making a decision that could be detrimental to the relationship that we were intended and purposed to have with our kids. Does that make sense? If our kids are not voluntarily givers, it's going to hurt the relationship with the child and the parent. But here's the thing. Kids aren't the only ones that wrestle with that. Kids aren't the only ones that wrestle with that. We have 23-year-olds, 33-year-olds, 53-year-olds, 73-year-olds, maybe even 93-year-olds that have an issue, that are still struggling, 
and eventually you're sabotaging themselves with their heavenly father all of the time. You see, we snatch up our candy and don't want to share. We love to collect candy. We love to count candy, invest candy, get high returns on them. We like to show off our candy. We feel better about ourselves depending on how much candy we have. We think the person with the most candy wins in life. But Jesus said, be on guard from all kinds of greed because a person's life does not consist in the abundance of their candy, also known as their possessions. Oh, we're going to get into it today. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that you should share your candy. Share your candy first with your Father in heaven. Now, we know that, or we should know that. By now, I'm not talking about candy, candy. We're talking about money. But for kids... Candy can seem like money. I remember in school, I used to take candy and I tried to sell it. I was an entrepreneur. I was an entrepreneur in Catholic school. I had to go undercover though, so my tie that was a clip on had a little slot underneath it. And I would stuff the candy in it so when they frisked me, the nuns, they couldn't find the candy. But I, was, I, I would hold my tie like this so it wouldn't move too much. And then you hear the, rack, the little crackling. Just a little inside on me. I get distracted easy. And so Jesus is saying to us to share our money first with our Heavenly Father. Now, remember the economic cycle that God created, right? He said plant grow and harvest, plant, grow and harvest, this economic cycle of working, right? God was building an economic fence for the people of Israel regarding the harvest. And Leviticus 23, 9 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you enter the land I am giving you and you harvest its first crops, Bring the priest a bundle of grain from the first cutting of your grain harvest. Can you say first? First. Not second, not third, and definitely not last. First. So to the people of Israel, God says, when you get to the harvest part, after you work, after you work, right, after you plant, after you grow, after you work, the harvest part, when you get to the harvest, the very first thing, the first 10% belongs to God. And like many of us, like many of us, Israel struggled a bit in understanding and applying this. They struggled with handling their first fruits. In fact, God again reiterates it at the end of Leviticus. Now, just in case you're in the room and you're not sure what is the term or the term, what does the term tithe mean? A tithe is a mathematical term that means one-tenth, one-tenth, okay? And God reminds the people of Israel that one-tenth of everything from the land, right, that which they've been growing, that which they've planted, that which they worked and harvested one-tenth of that. Everything that they've earned from that land, whether it's grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. Now, you don't have to open yours. I'm going to open mine. You get a little more than 10, Right? It gave you 15, just in case you wanted to count. It gave you 15. They're not stingy. But I put away 10 little, I'll put it over here. Maybe you can see it, maybe you can't. But out of these 10, he's saying put one 
That first one comes to me. You can have the rest. But that first one, one, comes, belongs to the Lord. Now, here's why. In week one, we saw that God established himself as the provider. He established himself as our provider and for the people of Israel. God is the provider of the harvest that we experience that we get to enjoy. The harvest is the fruits of your labor. God provides that. He is the source of all things. And so the first fruits, the first 10% of our harvest belongs to him. And maybe our language today needs to change around this tithing principle so that we can better understand it. Maybe it should sound like the tithe isn't what we give to God. It's the tithe is what we return to God because it belongs to him. Right? This, all ten of it, belongs to him. And him in his heart of generosity to provide for us, he's given us the tools, the insight, the wisdom, the skills, the talents, the abilities. It says if you work you will have fruit. You will have a harvest. Here's, I'm giving you the harvest. I, God, am giving you the harvest. And when I give you the harvest, just take something out. Take that first one and give it to me. The rest is yours. For us today, this looks like giving God the first 10% of our gross income back to God because it belongs to him. Now, some of you may be sitting, hey, Pastor, but why the gross and not the net? <laughs> Why do I got to get them <laughs> the very first? Why not the net? Because the net is a little, a little less. A little less. Great question. But here's the thing. God made it clear to the people of Israel in Leviticus that the tithe should be the first. The first, right? Not the second, not the third, not the fourth, and definitely not the last. The first. There is something really significant about this principle, right? The principle of first when it comes to tithe, to tithing. So before anything, before your taxes, before your health insurance, before your Netflix subscription, mm -hmm, right? Before any of that, you got to give God his first. God gets his first. Look at what it says in Proverbs, also known as the book of wisdom. It echoes the significance of the first fruits, and it takes it even a step further. It says Proverbs 3, 5 to 10. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom and said, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Honor the Lord, honor the Lord, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything that you produce. I'll say that again. Verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything that you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits. So let's just say that your wealth is this bag of Skittles. Whatever Skittles God divvies up to us, right? Whatever Skittles that God divvies up to us, we honor him with the first fruit, right? If you want to open up your bags of candy, you can. I see some of you looking at the candy and not me, right? Honor him with the first fruit. What does, it, what does it mean to honor the Lord with your first fruits? This means that if grape is your favorite, then give God your favorite. That if cherry is your favorite, then give God your cherry. Don't try to slide God the little nasty green and yellow ones. 
Because that's not honoring God with your best. Does that make sense? If you don't like these, if you, you, you leave them in the bag, you throw them at people, right? You step on them, right? If you don't like the green and yellow ones and you try to slide these over to God, God, these are for you. Woo-hoo! You're not giving God your best. Your best are these little scrumptious cherry ones because that's what you like. And God is saying, first me. You can have the rest. First me. You don't show honor to anyone by giving them the things that you don't like. But pastor, I give to this and to that. Again, you don't show honor to anyone by giving them the things that you don't like. You honor them by giving them your best. Giving them your best. Through tithing, we are acknowledging that God is the source, that he is our provider by giving him the first. But we are also honoring him by giving him our best. That's why when I pray for our tithe and offerings, I I ask that, Lord, that you be honored and glorified by our giving. Because we have chosen to give you the first fruits. Simply put, when God gets the first of our harvest, he gets the best of your heart. When we choose to honor God, right, with the first of our harvest, he is getting our best. All of this points to us understanding and that trusting God includes trusting Him with our finances. Truth be told, there are people here today that do not trust God with their finances. They trust God when it comes to God, man, I got this little paper cut on my finger and it hurts. In the name of Jesus, heal it. I trust God that he's going to come through for other people. I trust God that he's going to take care of this situation. I trust God that he's going to mend this relationship. I trust God when he says, do not steal, I shall not steal. But when it comes to my finances, when it comes to my money, I don't know if I trust God. And that makes you an economic atheist. This is why tithing is the benchmark. It's the beginning point. It's the beginning point. Trusting God means uh, treating tithing as the first step, not the finish line. Tithing is where you start. I've heard people say, man, I can give God whatever I feel like giving. And the reason they're saying this is usually because they want to keep all of their skittles. Because they don't like sharing. They don't. They want to keep all of the Skittles for themselves. Did you know that Scripture, in Scripture, in the Word of God, there are over 2,000 Scriptures that talk about money. 2,000 Scriptures that talk about money, and about 500 that talk about faith, and about 500 that talk about prayer. Thus, why this is a serious matter for believers. And God knew that. He knew that we would have issues with this. He knew that. And that's why he kept talking about it, so that we can dissect it and and meditate on it and, and see how that works for us. Listen, when we tithe, we are living within the fence that God created for us And we get to experience God's blessing for our lives. In other words, when we live within the boundaries, the fence that God has purposed for you to live in, you will get to experience all that he has for you. But the moment you step outside of that fence and do what you want to do, 
and handle things your way and set your own priority. You are now living outside of God's will. Oh, Pastor, how are you going to say that? That's offensive. No, it's not. It's what the Word of God says. And that's what he's saying in over 2,000 scriptures. You're either within the fence or you're outside of the fence. There is no middle ground with this. I like it here. The fan is hitting me here. That's very good right here. Church, we get to experience God stepping into our lives and making a positive impact in our lives when we live within God's fence. There is nothing like the blessing of God. There is nothing, nothing, nothing in this world that could amount to God's blessings. Nothing equal to it. We cannot buy it. We cannot borrow it. But we can obey for it. We can live within the fences. Let me put it like this. There are two types of fun in life. Two types of fun. There is a fun that comes with our father's frown. In other words, he's not happy. And the fun that comes with his blessings. You get to choose which fun you want to experience. Let me, let me put it into context for you. This is the kind of fun that an atheist might manage, or this is the kind, this is how an atheist might manage their money. First comes fun, which makes a lot of sense because it's all about them. Right? Fun, fun, fun. They don't believe in God, nor do they believe that he exists. Therefore, they more than likely are all about materialistic stuff. They would not give to somebody who is not there or that they cannot physically see for no reason at all. That's not fun for them. If I was an atheist... If I was an atheist, I would join them. I would join them. It would be fun. I can solely focus on taking care of me, right? It's all about me. I can just take care of about me. <laughs> Wouldn't you if you were an atheist? Right? If you were an atheist, it's, it has to be about you. What else would it be, would it be about? I mean, if you look at the priority of how the average atheist would handle their money, it makes a lot of sense to us. I go along, that, along with that, that person. So then, after my needs, my needs, I might take care of my debt because people tend to put their needs before their debt. Then I might tend to save a little and at the end, if and only if there's anything left, I might, I might. That's a small might, I might share. That can make a lot of sense if, you, if you're an atheist, and it's highly likely that this is, how many pe this, is, this is how many people's budgets are actually aligned. But here's the thing. I'm not an atheist. I'm not an atheist. I'm a theist, right? I believe in God the Father. I believe that he is my provider. I believe my blessings come from him. I believe that he built a fence around me that not only gives me the parameters for an economic cycle to exist, but why I am different than the atheist who does not believe in him. And it's just the opposite of an atheist. I begin with the first fruits. That is why I tithe. I give my first fruits. It's the first 10 for me, right? It's the first thing that, that Monica and I do. We give the first fruits, right, from the gross, from the very beginning of every income I get, whether it's from, 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 from church, whether it's from my odd end jobs that I do, from whatever it is. If someone blesses me with a gift, guess what? It's the first thing that I'm going to cut a tithe from. 
because I believe within my heart that God is my provider. And if he is my provider, then I shall not lack. I shall not want anything because every good and perfect gift comes from his hand. So yes, I will tithe. It's the first tenth of me. The very first thing that I do is acknowledge that God is first in my life and that I am not first in my life. So he is my first and my foremost. If you follow scripture, there's wisdom in saving, right? In fact, it's called the 10 10 80. It's living wisely. The first 10% goes to him. And then if it's possible, the second 10% goes to savings. And God may even ask some of you to further, take a step further, right? And work and give to his kingdom a little bit more. And then with the 80% that's left, we take care of our needs. We take care of our debt. And then comes fun. At this level of fun, it's real, it's real fun. It's actually real fun because you've done everything right. And we can actually, truly, and freely have fun. Does this mean that God is anti-stuff? Does this mean that God is anti-Nike? No. Under Armour. No, God is not anti-stuff. God is not anti the things that you like, the purses, the cars, the houses. He's not anti that. He created the material world, and he's the author of it. He's not anti-stuff, but he is anti-disorder. He does not like disorder. He does not like when you put things in the places it doesn't belong because God is a God of order. When God describes how we should handle our finances and we turn, uh, we in turn flip it upside down and live like an atheist and call ourselves followers of Jesus, no wonder we have huge conflicts in life. No wonder we have financial stress. No wonder finances is still the number one issue or cause of divorces in marriages. No wonder people are struggling to hold it together because we have chosen to live outside of the fence. Chosen to live outside of the fence. Philippians 4, 11 says, not that I was ever in need for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whatever it is, with a full stomach or the full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Paul writes this because there are things that we all have to learn. There have been seasons for my family where we had little, and there have been seasons for my family where we have had, uh, we've been blessed with an abundance. And when there were, and when we were in the seasons of uh, where things were tight, we still made it a priority to give God first, and God took care of us, and He made sure that we had everything that we needed. And I was reminded time and time again through those dark seasons of life that God is my provider, that he will come through, that his promises are yea and amen. And he took care of our family during those times. Listen, the disciples came to Jesus and, he, and said, we don't have anything. We're giving everything up so that we can serve and follow you. And you know how he answers them? He said, any followers of me that are giving up their homes and their financial resources, listen, you will get a hundred times, the, you will get a hundred times that in the kingdom to come in heaven. So let's do some basic math. A hundred times means that if I've given $50,000 over a period of time, right? That means that's $5 million 
is waiting for me in heaven. Now, I don't know exactly how Jesus wants to kind of, kind of do the exchange there. But I do know I like those numbers. I do like, I like those numbers. I don't know how that measures up. But if you think that I'm crazy, right, for believing that, for thinking that, then I have a question. What do you believe? What do you believe? You're telling me that you believe Jesus Christ will forgive you of your sins and take you to heaven. But how you understand and handle money, that won't impact what happens in heaven. Church, if we say that we're a follower of Jesus, why wouldn't we believe all of it? Maybe it's because we, we just love stuff too much and the fear of the future is exposing the struggle that we have with economic atheism. God reminds us in Malachi 3.8 to, to not steal from him. To not steal from him. Imagine that, that God has to tell us to not steal from him. Let me wrap this up this morning. Friends, God knows that the most difficult area for us to turn over to him is our finances. He knows that. Which is right after he tells the people of Israel that they are robbing him in tithing and offerings. God says to them, test me. Test me. The only place where God says, to test him on anything is this. Test me. Our Heavenly Father, church, is inviting us in. Imagine your kid getting to the point where they are willingly sharing with you all that you've given to them. There's something that, there's something that it does for us in our hearts when we experience that when our kids are just willingly givers, when they're willingly sharing with you as their parent, when they understand that you are their provider, that you have given to them, and they're saying, hey, mom, dad, here, here's some. They open that bucket, take, take whatever you want. Just blesses you. kind of makes you want to buy the whole Willy Wonka chocolate factory for them. Because that's how parents are. We love our children. And we want to bless our children. We want to make sure that their needs are being taken care of. Right? That's what we want as parents. We want them to live a better life than what we've lived. And so we continue to dig in our pockets and in our purses and we continue to give to them. Because we love them. When we experience that, there is a sense of no end to what we will give back to our kids. And this is all that Papa God is trying to do for us, trying to teach us. That's the point of this message today. Will you trust him? You've got to ask yourself, what are you doing with the tithe anyway? What are you doing with the tithe? And anyway, we get this little cherry one, because that's the best of it. What are you doing? If you're not giving it to him, what are you doing with it anyway? If you're not honoring God with what he has given you, what did you get instead? What did you buy? Who did you give it to? Who did you invest it in? What did you do with what you did not give to God? Maybe you got to eat out a little more. Maybe you got a little more vacation. Maybe you got a new ride. Maybe you got a bigger house. Maybe you got better clothing. 
I mean, I've had seasons where I've practiced saying to God that my, what my excuse would be for not honoring him with my first fruits. And honestly, my excuses were so lame that I was embarrassed. I was really embarrassed that I would try to muster up words that ex- that, that try to come up with an excuse of why I didn't give God my very best. My provider. The one who gives me everything. And so I just have to trust him. I have to say yes to him. I have to honor him with my first fruits. But here's the thing, church. That's for me. That's what me and Monica have chosen to do. That's what we are trying to teach our kids to do. You have to figure that out for yourself. You have to answer those questions for yourself. Do you trust God? You see, tithing is not an issue of money. It's an issue of trust. Do you trust him? Will you trust him? 